Right, so what happens if we have two samples and we calculate the means for each sample and we want to compare whether the means are equal or whether they're not equal, okay? So we would use a um, t-test for two populations, okay? And so that occurs when we have two samples and we've calculated the mean for each sample. So sample one and sample two. So this is a sample average of sample one. This is a sample average for the second sample. We also have N1 and N2, so each sample each sample could be of different size, so this is the sample size of each sample. And you also estimate the sample standard deviation um, for each sample. Okay, now let's set up um, what the null and alternate hypothesis would look like. So, if we wanted to simply see whether these two um, averages are equal to each other or not, um, I'd set it up like this. So we'd if they're both equal, we would be saying that the population mean in sample one minus the population mean of sample two must equal to zero. Okay, that's if they're both equal, right? If they're not equal, then, or the opposite of that claim must be that they're not equal to zero, okay? And so we can, um, and obviously the claim with the equal sign is a null hypothesis, and the claim without the equal sign is the alternate hypothesis. Okay, so the next thing you have to do is to calculate um, the t-statistic and you draw the rejection region um, on the standard uh, distribution. So this is a two-tailed test, okay? So this is a two-tailed test because we have a not equal sign in the alternate hypothesis. Um, okay, so what we do know is that we have, it, because it's a two-tailed test, we have two rejection regions, one at the upper tail and one at the lower tail. And we also know, because this is like a standard, you know, student T distribution, or it's like a standard normal distribution, it's symmetrical around zero. Now, at this point, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, you have to make some assumptions. Okay, if we can assume that both samples have the same population variance, okay, so if the population variance of sample of, of of you know population one is equal to the population variance of you know of population two, then it's a little bit easier. Okay, we, we can use um, some simpler calculations. If this doesn't hold, then we'll be, then we'll have to use um, then we'll have to use some more complicated calculations. There's a formal test for this called the F test for for equal variances, which we won't which we won't get into today in this in this um, little talk. But so in the meantime, let's assume for simplicity that the two population variances are equal. Okay, so what can we do? And then I'll show you the other case as well. So when the two population variances are equal, the degrees of freedom, we'll call it V, okay, degrees of freedom is equal to N1 plus N2 minus 2. Okay, so that's our degrees of freedom. Okay, why do we need our degrees of freedom? Well, because we need it when we're using our student T tables to find the critical values. The critical values will tell us the cutoff for these rejection regions. So um, this is a, a general setting. So let's imagine um, that this equaled to 50, okay? So your sample size of one plus your sample size of sample two minus two equals to 50, hypothetically. So we look at our you know, student T distribution, okay? And so we look, up, um, we look up 50 for our degrees of freedom. And suppose we're testing, I don't know, at the 5% at the level, meaning that the um, rejection region each contain 2.5%. Because remember, for a two-tailed test, the rejection region, the area of the rejection region is equal to the significance level, which is 5%, divided by 2. So that's for a two-tailed test. So we get 2.009. So what we now know is that the cutoff is 2.009, and because it's symmetrical around 0, the other cutoff must be negative 2.009. Okay? Okay, now the next step okay, well the last step really, is just to see where our t-statistic lies. So these are rejection regions, so I, I like to label it RR, okay, rejection regions, which means if our t-statistic lies in the rejection region, we reject the null hypothesis. If our t-statistic lies outside the rejection region, we don't reject the null hypothesis. And we simply have to calculate our t-statistic. So 
we're basing it on this assumption here, okay, where our population variances are equal, and so our t-stat is equal to um, x hat 1 minus x hat 2, okay, minus our hypothesized value, okay, divided by um, the square root, okay, we call this the pooled um, standard deviation. It's a long formula. It's, it's, it gets a little bit more convoluted, right, than when we're doing it for one sample. Okay. All right. So in our t stat, it's simply our sample, um, our sample mean for sample one minus the sample mean for sample two. Okay. These are our hypothesized values. Okay. And if we remember, we assume the null hypothesis is true on, unless proven otherwise. So mu one minus mu two is equal to zero. Okay. Null is uh, assumed true until proven otherwise, so you sub zero in here, okay? Sometimes you might want to test if the difference is equal to two or the difference is equal to three, and that's when you'd sub in two or three in here, okay? But in this case, we want to test whether they're different or not, so this is equal to zero. N1 is quite simple. That's just our population, our sample size for sample one, sample size for sample two, and SP. Now, what's SP? Okay, the pooled standard deviation is like a weighted average um, sample standard deviation, um, SP, and so the pooled variance, sorry, so standard deviation squared is equal to um, N1 minus 1 times S1 squared plus N2 minus 1 times S2 squared, okay, divided by N1 plus N2 minus 2, okay. And so um, we have all these variables already, right? You already have the sample sizes. You already have your um, sample uh, standard deviations. So you sub them in, you find out what your pooled variance is, and you substitute that in here, and you calculate that, and you'll get to your t-stat, okay? Once you have your t-stat, you just simply have to see whether it lies um, in your rejection region, and if it does, you reject your null hypothesis, or if it lies outside your rejection region. And if it does, you do not reject your null hypothesis. Okay, let's see how this would be different if our population variances were not equal, okay? So the formula gets a little bit different, okay? Um, so the main thing is our degrees of freedom, so we'll call it V, okay, is equal to um, S to one divided by, it's just gonna be a huge calculation, okay, just to get this one number. Um, so it's a little bit of a hassle. So, squared, n1 squared divided by n1 minus one, plus, um, Okay, so this is a formula now for your degrees of freedom, okay? It looks huge, so it's a bit of a hassle to calculate, but you have all this data already, right? You have your sample sizes, okay? And you also have your sample standard deviation. So you sub them in, and you'll get your degrees of freedom, okay? And so then, once you have your degrees of freedom, so hypothetically, let's say you sub that in, and you find it to equal to 35. Then we look it up in our student t distribution, okay? So hypothetically, let's say our degrees of freedom is equal to 35, and again, we're testing at the 5% significance level, so we look up 2.5%, and that's 2.030, okay? So what we do is we simply have to draw our distribution, okay? And let's assume it's the same question, so we have our rejection region, right? We have our rejection region, and we found it to be 2.03. Okay, it's symmetrical, so the other rejection region must be negative 2.03, okay? And then all we have to do now is calculate our t-statistic. And if our t-statistic lies in here, we don't reject the null. If it lies in here, we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so how do we calculate the t-statistic um, for this test when our population variances Okay, when our population variances are not equal, well, it looks like this. Uh, T stat 
is equal to, okay? So our sample our mean for sample one, okay? Minus sample mean for sample two, okay? Minus the hypothesized difference, okay? According to the null hypothesis, so in our case it's zero, okay? Um, And again, we have all of this data, right? You already have your sample means, you've already calculated that. You have your, you know, this is our hypothesized um, population difference, right? And if we look back to the very start, you'll find that in the null hypothesis, okay, we hypothesize that it's equal to zero, so you just sub zero in here, and we have these values here, right? You'll have your sample variance for sample one, sample variance for sample two, and sample sizes, you sub that in and you figure out where you are here. If you're in your rejection region, okay, if, you, if your T stat lies in here in the rejection regions, you reject your null hypothesis. If your T stat lies outside the rejection region, then you do not reject your null hypothesis. Okay, just to quickly wrap up, all right, um, what happens if you wanted to know something, something a little bit different? What happens if the question is that the average for sample one is larger than the average for sample two. Okay, how do we test this? Well, let's bring everything onto the uh, left-hand side. So sample one minus sample two is larger than zero. Okay, now what's the counterclaim to that? The exact opposite. Well, the exact opposite of that would be this. Okay, if that's larger than zero, the opposite must be smaller or equal to zero. Okay, and what's our null hypothesis look like? Well, our null What's our null and alternate hypothesis look like? Remember, our null hypothesis is the one with the equal sign. Okay? And our alternate hypothesis must be the other one. Okay? Okay, so this is what our null and alternate hypotheses will look like once it's a one-sided test. Okay? Um, if you want to know whether one, one um, average is larger than the other. So you just have to be careful now when you draw your distribution because it's an upper tail test, right? Remember, we know it's an upper tail test because in our alternate hypothesis, we have a larger than sign. Then when you draw your you know, standard like normal distribution or your student T distribution, it's symmetrical around zero, but you now only have one rejection region in the upper side or the upper tail of, the, of your distribution. And all the steps are the same, okay? Um, Alright, I hope this helps and good luck.